Hey folks, welcome back. And so in this video, we are going to talk about the remainder of the topics related to inheritance. Um, so the first video was kind of the introduction to inheritance, and I wanted to give a moment for all that to sink back in before we go into a little bit more detail. So if you didn't understand the first video, probably recommend you go back and rewatch that one again um, before you watch this one. But anyway, all right, so a couple of things. Magically, every object that you use and have ever written inherited from an object named object. Okay, so there is a magical object, and it is called object, and it exists in both Java and in C Sharp. It is object, and it is at the root. And literally every object in both Java and C Sharp automatically inherits from object, whether you like it or not. Why is this done? Well, because all objects have certain things that they need to be able to do. And so those things are defined in the root object. And then when you create you know, your dog, class dog, if you didn't specify that it inherited from mammal or from something else, then automatically it will inherit from object. So if you were, look at, if you were to look at the tree of all objects in the world, what you would see is something like this. You would always have object, and then you have everything that you've ever created. So maybe your dog, maybe you have car, and maybe you have whatever other things that you may have created over the years. And UML-wise, they all do that. They all inherit from there. This has always been true. It's just that you never knew about it. So when you say class dog, implicitly what you're actually saying is class dog inherits from object. And then you've got your curly braces with your class definitions in there. You've never had to say that, and you never do have to say that, but it automatically happens whether you like it or not. So what are some of the things that object gives you? Like, why do we have this? Well, there's one interesting one, which we've kind of danced around a couple of times, but we've never really talked about it, and that is the magical method to string. Um, in Java, it's written as this um, with a lowercase t. In C Sharp, it's written with a capital T. So very specifically, what to string does is it takes the object and it converts it into a string for you automatically. The default in both Java and C Sharp for exactly what that does are slightly different, but in both cases it returns the name of the class, and then in one case it re also returns the memory location. In Java it'll give you the memory location. Not that that's particularly useful. So if I come over here and I create a new replet, just to explain what I've been just saying, I'll do this one in C Sharp just to do something different. Um, so every object inherits from an object called object, and that object inherently has a method called toString. And what toString does is um, prints the object out. So let's see what's going on here. Um, okay. Doop, 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 doop. All right, so I'm going to create a new class. I'm going to call it dog, or doc, or dod, and um, I'm going to give it some integer x, which is equal to 7. Great. I'll make that public. All right, so down here in my main, I'm going to say dog, my dog, equals new dog, and I'm going to attempt to print out my dog dot x. All right, and so what we would expect here is that the number seven is going to be printed. No big surprise, because I made a dog, that dog has an attribute, and I asked it to print that out. If I had not specified the dot x at the end of that, and I had not specified an attribute, I had just asked it to print my dog, what does that mean? Well, when I run that, what I'm going to get back is the word dog. Now you might say, where exactly is dog coming from? What's happened here with this is, Console.WriteLine expects you to pass a string. We know that. This is typically a string, and it can be in double quotes and some string, and then plus some other string and plus some other string, or whatever, but it must be a string. So when I passed it a dog, it said, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to take your dog and I'm going to convert it into a string. Then I'm going to print out the result of that. So how did that happen? Well, the way it happened is, the toString method in dog was called. And you say, 
but there is no two-string method in dog, and you're right. But dog inherently inherited, I, I wish I would stop saying inherently, dog inherits from object. And so as a result, object has a method called toString that simply prints out the name of the object that it's referring to. So because of this inheritance that's been there magically all along, that's why you get the word dog. Inside of the dog class, I'm going to try and create a method called toString. So I'm going to say public string toString, and I'm going to return a string. So I'm going to say return hi, and I'm going to try running that. So now what's going to happen is it's going to attempt to call toString up here, but there's a problem and you can see the compiler tells you exactly what the problem is. I've defined a method called toString, but that's hiding an inherited method called object.toString, and if that's what I meant, then I needed to specify that I was overwriting. If it's not what I meant, then I need to name it something other than toString. So it has said, because dog in, inherits from object, and please note, I took back out the thing that said colon object. This is just happening automatically whether you want it or not. But you can see right there, it says object.toString. You have that through inheritance, and you are now trying to create dog.toString, but that doesn't make sense because you have the same method name, and you didn't specify that you're trying to overwrite. So what do you want to do? Well, I could certainly call this toString2, and now it'll all work, but I'm still just going to get dog because that's not the method that is called to convert a object into a string. The method that's called is called toString. So my only solution to this is to type in the word override. And hopefully this will make override a little bit more sense now. Because object had a toString method that prints out the name of the object, and because all everything inherits from object, you inherently have the ability to say print and an object name. What happens is it calls the toString method in that object. The default is you'll just get printed out the object name because that's what you inherit from object. If you wanted to do something other than that, which is quite often the case, then you have to override the toString method in order to specify what it is you wanted to do. And so you can certainly print out anything that you want in here, and so you can access all the variables, and that's going to print out hi7 for some strange reason. All right? The common thing is, when you have an object like a dog, you would probably want the dog to say, hi, I'm Fluffy, and I weigh three pounds, and I have four legs, and my fur is brown, or whatever is the case. That's an example of why you might want to overwrite two strings so that you have the ability to call console.writeLine on it and have it do something useful. Of course, you could have not done this. You could have simply console.writeLined hi plus my dog dot x, and that will print out exactly the same thing without calling the toString method. But having the object already have a method that knows how it's how to convert itself into something useful means that every time you go to write out the details about a dog, you don't have to recreate the exact string, you just call it. This is another example of encapsulation. You're encapsulating the method of how to convert yourself into a string in with the class so that every object has that ability. And in this case, it's one that you're overwriting from object. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, the equivalent code for that in Java, instead of putting the word overwrite here, there's an at override above it. And this has to be a lowercase t instead of an uppercase t to make this work in Java. Other than that, this code will work exactly the same if you want to type it in. All right. So object is the mother of all objects. It is the mother of all classes. It is always there. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't get rid of the object or anything like that. As a matter of fact, every part of the Java language and every part of the C Sharp language inherit from object. Math inherits from object. Everything inherits from object. So it is the root of the language, effectively. It's not just toString that's up there. There are other methods up there, and we'll take a look at some of those. But to be fair, toString is the one that you're going to use the most. And frequently, you're going to want to override it to have it print something more useful. Okay, so we've talked before about invisible code. We've talked about constructors that are magically there whether you make them or not. Let's talk a little bit about more invisible code. So class mammal, as we just did with dog, inherently is the same as class mammal extends object. 
this is C sharp, um, excuse me, this is Java. If it says extends, it will be a colon if it is in um, C sharp. There it is in C sharp. So these are identical. These two blocks of code. You never have to type the colon object, and please don't do that. It's it's unnecessary and it's confusing because it's inherent. It is always there. We need you to understand that it's always there because that's why two string works. All right. Here's the example of overriding two string. So we have class mammal, which again we're for whatever reason calling out it inherits from object. We've got a weight and an IQ, and then we have a constructor that sets the weight and the IQ. And then we have our class dog, which inherits from mammal. And so we have decided here that we are going to override two string. So the new version of it is going to make a new string called s. It's going to have the word weight is plus weight, and then it's going to have and IQ is plus IQ, and then a carriage return, and then it returns S. Okay, the most common thing that I see people do with toString, which is a mistake, is to have a system.out.println or a console.write line in the middle of the code for toString. To be clear, toString should never print anything. It is, as its name suggests, a method that returns a string that represents the object. You do not call print in there, you just return a string. It's up to the calling method that is trying to use it as a string to convert, to actually do the printing, all right? So this is our example in C-sharp. It's pretty much exactly what I wrote. The equivalent in Java is this. And as I mentioned, when you do public string to string, you would optionally write at override above it. You should get in the habit of writing it. Okay, so why is this optional in Java, but it's mandatory in C-sharp? Well, to be honest with you, I think it's kind of a bug in Java that it's not mandatory. And the reason is because you notice that in C Sharp, it was very specific about what the problem was. It said, I don't know what you're trying to do here. There are two possible interpretations of you having a two string method in dog. One interpretation is that you're trying to make a new method and you just happen to pick a reserved keyword. The other interpretation is that you're trying to override the two string that you inherited. And I don't know which one you mean, so I'm not going to try and guess. I'm just going to error and make you be explicit as to which one you want. Java is going to guess. And the problem with that is you may think you're overwriting a method and not actually be overwriting the method because you may have typoed the name. If you put in override and there is nothing called that same name in the parent, you'll get an error. Java will complain and say, you said you were overwriting this, but that doesn't exist up above. If you don't put it in, you'll just have two different methods that are named ever so slightly differently with a typo in the name, and they're not actually overwriting each other, and that's going to be awful when you're trying to debug a problem, because it's going to look like you're successfully calling the method, but you're actually calling the one in the parent, not the one in the child, because it wasn't a successful override. So my point is, if you compile Java code without the word at override above each one of your overrides, will it work? Yes, it will. If you put it on a test or a quiz and you don't specify at override, will we take off points? Probably not, but you really, really, really should always put in the at override. Best practice for Java is that you should specify it. In C Sharp, you don't get the choice because it's mandatory. You have to specify that's what you're trying to do. So the override tells the compiler to check that what you're asking for is actually correct. All right, so other than that, Nothing new is happening here. We have an overwrite of two string for dog. We're making a dog and then we're printing out the dog and you're gonna get something like weight is seven, IQ is 45 because of this string up here, all right? So what do you get from this object that we have spoke about? Well, it's slightly different between C Sharp and Java and much of this you're probably never going to use, but I'll explain many of these methods either way. I'll pick out the, the, um, the biggest ones that you may care about. So again, this slide is about C Sharp. We mentioned two string, which has a capital T and a capital S. I'm just gonna to flip to the Java slide for a moment and I'm going to point out that the two string is in here as well. And that's a lowercase t with an uppercase S. Okay, so what else could you have inside of object? This is the root object named object. What methods does it expose? Well, it has, opti um, it has a method called equals that exists in both of them. There's equals in Java and equals in C Sharp. What these methods do is if you have two objects and you wanna know if they're actually the same object, you can pass them either in C Sharp as two, two objects into the same uh, equals method, 
or you can just say object one dot equals open parentheses and then pass it object number two and it will tell you. Finalize is a method that's unique to C sharp, which tries to clean up um, all of the um, resources that are associated with it. Um, and then you've got some other things like get hash code, which there's an equivalent over here called hash code. It returns a hash code for the object. What does that mean? It tells you a very specific number that represents this object in memory effectively. Not something that you'll use very often. Um, get type is a cool one. It will tell you what type the object is. So if you say get type on a dog, so I created dog fluffy gets new dog, and I say fluffy dot get type, it will return back dog, which is useful. Um, and over in the um, Java world, there really is no direct equivalent to that. All right. And then there's a bunch of stuff in the Java world which has to do with notifying and wait, which are all related to threads. And in a few weeks, five weeks or so, we're going to deal with concurrency and threads. And I will talk a little bit more about some of those, but they're also inherited up from object. All right. The second thing to mention here, and this is going to be mostly for our engineering folks who came from C++. In C++, it is possible to have one object inherit from two different objects or two different parents. And so you could have a man and you could have a wolf and you might have a werewolf, which takes both of those and it would have the sum of all of the attributes and all of the methods. C sharp and Java do not support this. So let me be clear, this is not allowed in C sharp or Java which are the two languages we're talking about. There are inherent problems in this, and the example here shows one. If you have a run method in both of these, which one is that? How do you know which one you're getting? And so that's one of the issues. Later on in the class, we're going to talk about something called interfaces, and both C Sharp and Java allow you to do something similar to this using interfaces, but that's a lecture in a couple of weeks. So that's coming up. All right. So next up, let's talk about how you refer to things when you're dealing with these inherited classes. All right, so we're going to do a new example here. We have a class phone, and it has a manufacturer and a version, and we have a constructor. And this constructor takes in a manufacturer and a version, and it sets the manufacturer and the version. It has a void initialize, which turns on the phone or sets its IMEI number or whatever. And we have a constructor that takes nothing in, and all phones are inherently going to be a Nokia version 1.337, which are indestructible, if you know the joke about Nokias. All right, so this is a class about a phone, and we no you notice that we're using the word this in here. And we've mentioned this before. There was a whole lecture talking about the this keyword. When you take in a variable or a parameter at the top called manufacturer, but you also have a class attribute called manufacturer, it's ambiguous as to which one you're referring to inside of your code. Without the keyword this, you would have ended up saying manufacturer equals manufacturer, and that doesn't make sense. So at the time we said, if you want to deambiguate or disambiguate, you would say this dot manufacturer equals manufacturer. And what happens there is the second one refers to the parameter from the method, whereas the first one, because of the this keyword, refers to this. We didn't explain why at the time because it wasn't really relevant, but now let me explain why. In general, this refers to the object in which you are currently coding. So anytime you see the word this, you can know that it is talking about this object that we are in, which is why it's called this. It makes some sense. This can actually be used in a different way, which we didn't talk about before. So let's take a look at this uh, method. We have phone, which takes in no parameters, and it makes a call to a method called this and passes it two parameters. Well, as you can see, there is no method called this inside of the object phone. So what is happening here? Well, as I mentioned, this refers to the object, the class phone, the one that we are currently in. So when you say this, it's going to call phone and pass it this. this. Sorry, it's going. Ugh, it's hard to say this and not say this. All right, it is going to call the class, and it is going to pass 
the parameters that I am highlighting. If you remember, any time that I would say phone, my phone equals new phone, open parentheses, and then have two arguments, what I'm doing is I'm calling the constructor of the object, my phone. And that's exactly what this is going to do here. Because there are two parameters here, it knows that I'm effectively calling the constructor that takes two parameters where the first one is a string and the second one is a float, which turns out to be this constructor right here. So to call a different constructor, you simply say this and you pass parameters to it. And this refers to the class that you are currently working in. All right, so those are two different uses of the word this. They mean the same thing. You're always talking about the current class that you're working in. All right, so now, now let's add in a couple of other verbs. So there is super, and base. Super is the Java word, base is the C-sharp word. So if you're one of my C-sharp folks, I need you to remember the word base. If you're one of my Java folks, I need you to remember the word super. So if you are in a child class, such as our phone in the last example, or perhaps you're in dog versus mammal. So there was mammal, which is a parent, there's dog, which is a child, and they both have a method, let's say, called bark. For some reason in the dog, you want it to do a different thing than what the mammal does, because not all mammals bark. So you overrode bark. It was defined originally in mammal. You overrode it in dog. What happens if in dog you wanted to call the one that was in mammal? Well, you, you can't say parent dot, so you use super or base. So you can say super, and then you can say dot bark. Or if you want to call the constructor of your parent, you would just say super or base, depending on which language you're in. So if there's a method my method, you can call it by doing that to access your parent's method. Now, let me be clear. You don't always have to say super. So let's take an example. We have class mammal, which extends object. And we have void make noise, which prints out ow. All right, now we have our dog and we're going to override make noise. And what we're doing is we're going to call super make noise and then we're going to print out woof. So what happens when I make a dog and I ask him to make noise, he's going to print a woo and then woof. Why? Because I'm calling this method, which is an override. Please note it's an override. There is another method of the same name up here, but I have overridden it down here. I'm calling it in dog because I made a dog called him D, and that is this guy. So d.makeNoise is calling the make noise method inside of dog, which is this method, the overridden method. And what that method does is it first calls super make noise, and then it prints out wolf. So super make noise refers to, because it extends mammal, mammals make noise. Ow. And then I print wolf. So this is necessary to say super here, because if I had just say make noise, I would be referring to myself, which is not at all what I'm trying to do. It'll always default to the one that's local in this class, unless you specify super or base in order to do it to the parent. The this is the syntax in Java. It is super, and then you can call the method. In C Sharp, it is going to be base, and then you call the method, which is very, very similar. So this works the same way. There is a gotcha in C Sharp you should be aware of, and that's what's written up here in this. In C Sharp, if you want to be able to override a method, you must mark the method as virtual. Mm. So to be clear, if I say public void make noise, and I did this console, and then I make dog, which inherits from mammal, and I try to say public override void make noise, I am going to get a compile error. It's going to say you cannot override make noise because it, is, because it was not declared virtual. So at the time in the parent, C Sharp has the ability to prevent children from overriding methods. You might say, why would you want to do this? Well, there are occasionally times where you can declare at the top level, this is the only way that make noise can ever happen. And if that's what you want, then you just declare it as a method and life goes on. Don't put the word virtual in there. Anybody who inherits from mammal, if they want to have a method called make noise, it will say, oh, and there's nothing they can do about that. 
If you, however, want them to be able to overwrite it, then you put the word virtual in there. All right, Java does not have this requirement. In Java, you can overwrite any method by default. You do not have to specify it's virtual. There is no equivalent keyword. So this is a C-sharp only thing. Now you might ask, why is this relevant? Why would you do this? I don't understand why you would ever mark something as virtual or ever mark something as not virtual. Well, because again, picture something bigger. The way that gravity works in a game, if we go back to that example, is probably not something that you want individual classes later on redefining. So you may have certain things that are non-negotiable about your game. And if anybody's going to use this game engine, then they have to absolutely use this form of gravity. And if they try to do anything otherwise, they're going to get a compile error. That would be an example where you want to enforce something mandatorily in the parent such that the children cannot overwrite it. In C Sharp, you would not mark it as virtual in that case. If you want them to be able to overwrite it, you mark it as virtual. Okay, so as I said, super and base are the way that you can call a parent. Let me be clear, and I've mentioned this in the previous video, but I'm going to say it again. When you write code such that you have a class that inherits from another class, at the time that you instantiate the child, the child's constructor will be called, and then the parent's constructor will be called, whether you like it or not. So again, let me jump out and let me give you an example of this. So I have dog and right now it is overwriting to string and that's great. Let me put in class mammal above it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put a public int y equals three and I'm going to give us a constructor. So I'm going to say public mammal and what I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to set y equals four, and I'm just gonna print out something up here. All right, down in dog, I'm gonna make a constructor for the dog. Public dog, I'm going to set x equals nine, All right, and then just to clear things up, I'm going to comment out this console.write line. So to be clear, all that's left down here is I'm instantiating a dog. The dog inherits from mammal, which I forgot to write. So we're gonna go ahead and fix that real quick. So the dog is a mammal and the dog has its own constructor for dog and the mammal has its own constructor for mammal. So the surprising thing that I'm going to get as output here is I'm going to get um, yeah, I got a warning. And then I'm going to get high from mammal, high from dog. So what happened here? Well, all of the constructors all the way up the chain are going to fire. As a matter of fact, even the constructor in object fires, it just doesn't do anything. So when I made the dog, the constructor for dog began and immediately realized that it was inheriting from mammal. So it called its parents constructor. The parent's constructor fired, it said y equal to four, and it said hi for mammal, and I got my output. I then came down here, and now the dog fired, and I get hi from dog. And now the constructor is done, and I have my my dog down below, which I can now do with as I please. So note that nowhere in there did I specifically tell it I wanted to call the parent's constructor, it just happens. There is no way to stop it, it is going to call the constructor. As a matter of fact, if I don't put the constructor up here in mammal like this, and I run this, what's going to happen is I'm going to get hi from dog, and it is still calling the mammal's constructor. It's just that the mammal's constructor doesn't do anything. It set, um, it had no effect in that case because there's nothing up there for the constructor in mammal to do. So that's what I need you to understand is that whether you like it or not, each object and its parents constructors are all going to fire. So what happens if you particularly want it to fire at a specific time? So let's go take a look at this code. So I have um, a blank screen, there we go. I have a class mammal up at the top and I'm doing the same thing. I'm printing out mammals constructor inside of a constructor in mammal. 
And then I have a dog which inherits from mammal. And again, in that constructor, I'm printing out dog. And I'm doing nothing more than making a dog. And you notice that the output is mammal constructor, dog constructor. The same thing is happening over here in this code. The only thing that's different is I'm being a little bit more explicit. So in class at mammal, I'm actually very specifically saying I'm inheriting from object, which again is never necessary. And then in class dog, I'm specifying, by the way, I want you to call the mammals constructor. And that's how you would ask it to do that. Now you might say, well, if it's going to happen anyway, why on earth would I ever do that? Well, maybe the constructor that you want to call is not the one that has no parameters. Maybe the constructor you want to call is a overloaded constructor in mammal that takes in a mammal's name or fur or something else. And the specific of when you call dog, when you call the constructor in dog, you may want to say base, open parentheses, fluffy in double quotes, close parentheses. And now it's going to call the constructor that takes in a string up there. So you can affect which one is being called, but one of them is being called. You can decide whether you want the one with no parameters or whether you want something else by specifying the particulars in there. This is the C-sharp version. And again, it is colon base to say, I want to call my bases constructor, my parents constructor. If we zip over to, C, uh, to Java code, the difference here is that I'm going to put in the word super instead of the word base after the name. So the syntax is quite different here. In C-sharp, after the name, there was a colon and the word base in Java. Inside of the method, I actually am able to call super. And again, this is going to call the constructor, which would have happened either way. This is unnecessary code that's in yellow highlighting. But if I wanted a particular constructor to be called, I would specify the parameters in here as to what it is that I want. Okay, so the last topic in today's lecture is related to the access modifiers, which we have talked about slightly before, but they have a little bit more relevance now, and they also have a little bit more detail. So we've mentioned before, when you declare a variable, you can specify that that variable is public or private. That's what I told you up until now. And the definition was, if the variable is public, not only can methods inside the class change it and see it, but also methods outside of the class, such as in the main. So let's be clear about what public means again over here in my replet. Um, all right, we're going to turn off my Wi-Fi and we're going to turn it back on again because it's being weird. Thank you, KSU. All right, so um, up here in my mammal, I set y equal to 3 and I declared it to be public. I'm going to take, get rid of the, well, I'll leave the dog in here, but down at the bottom, I'm going to go ahead. All right, let's deal with this one instead. Sorry. Um, inside of my dog, I have an attribute called X and it is set to seven. And then in the constructor, it gets changed to nine. So down below, I can absolutely say console dot right line. Easy for me to say. My dog, which is the name of my object dot x. That is an attribute x that is declared to be public in dog and that will happily print out the number 7 for me. Okay, it's the number 9 because it gets changed in the constructor. I was able to access that because when that attribute was declared, it was declared public. So I'm going to change that. I'm going to now declare it as private and run the same code. It's no longer going to work. And the error message that I get is dog.x is inaccessible due to its protection level. So down here, I attempted in the main class to access my dog.x. My dog is of type dog, so it went up here and it looked and it said, mm, x is declared as private. So the only place where x can be seen or changed is within what's currently highlighted. You note that in the constructor, I'm still able to change x because I'm within that class but anything outside of that class cannot directly access it. And what we've talked about before is, in order to get around that, you would make getters and setters. So typically up here, you would have something like public set x, um, I'll call it set x, which takes in an integer, we'll call it y, and it says x equals y. And then likewise, you'd probably have, that should be a void because it's 
doesn't actually change anything or it doesn't return anything. And then you'd have a public int that get x, which takes no parameters and returns x. Okay, so now down in my main method, if I'm trying to access that x variable, instead of just directly accessing it, I would say get x as a method, and now life is going to be good. The compiler will no longer complain, and I will see the number 9. I have provided a way for me to get access to it by making getters and setters. All right, hopefully that was a review and that all made sense. That's the difference between public and private. But now we have another version, which is called protected. And if we go over to our class, we'll remember here that mammal is the parent and dog is below it. So I have a public variable y up in mammal. And down here in dog, I don't have a y, but I inherited the y from above. So let's take a look down in, in, um, in dog. Let me try and print out y in my constructor. Now note, I'm printing y, not x, and y is declared up here in mammal. Life should be good. When the constructor fires, I got high from dog, and I got a three. I, I didn't put a space in there, which is not great, but you know what I'm saying. That's because of this Y at the back. Um, all right, I'll just make it a little bit clearer so that it's obvious that, that the three is coming from there. And there you go, Y colon three. So that's because this is public. Just like, again, what we showed earlier, if I change that to private, then that's no longer going to work. It says Y dot mammal.y is inaccessible due to its protection level. All right, so now I'm going to change it to the other word, protected. We will now be able to see it. I'm going to say hi from dog, and I'm going to see the three. So from mammal to dog, which is a parent-child relationship, dog is able to see y because protected. So protected means not only can this class see it, which is what is going on when it's private, but all of my children can see it as well. That's protected. Private, it is only me. Only the class that it's written in is allowed to see it. So in the case of dog, only methods inside of dog are allowed to access that X because it is declared as private. In the case of mammal, any methods inside of mammal or its children will be able to access Y, but no one else. If I come down to the bottom and I try to access Y down here, so I'm going to say my dog Y, I'm going to get a protection error again because I cannot do that because I am not a child of um, mammal. And again, it's inaccessible due to the protection level. Let me be clear here that it sees that there's a Y there, so I created a dog, my dog, and I'm trying to access a variable named y in there. It sees that it's there even though y is not defined in dog at all. You can see there's no point where I make y or set y anywhere in the class dog. But because of the inheritance up to mammal and it has a y, there is effectively a y in here. It's just that that y is not accessible. If I change this from protected, which again is this class and its children, to public, now all of a sudden I will be able to see the Y because it inherited it and made it available to me down here. So hopefully that explains the difference between public, <laughs> public, private, and protected, which are the three keywords that you can use. To review, public means everyone can see it. Everyone in this method, everyone in my children, and everyone who is not even related to me, as long as they instantiate me, they can mess with it. They can see it, they can change it. Private means only methods inside of this class can change it. Protected means only methods inside of this class and my children's classes can, can change it. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. Those are the three levels. The fourth level is the default level. You know that you can create a variable or a method, and you cannot specify public or private before it. And what's happening there is you're getting the default for your language. The default varies, and it's a little bit complex as to which language has which. 
It's also different in namespaces, which is not something that we've talked about. It's possible to put packages of classes together and ship them as a whole entity. So for example, maybe I'm going to write the killer set of classes for rendering circles. So I'm going to have a class about circles and a class about spheres, and I'm going to have a class about growing them and shrinking them and translating them around the screen and scaling them in and out and rotating them or changing their colors and all these wonderful things. So that's 10, 15, 20 classes. What I would do is I would put all of that into a package and I would ship you the package. And then when you get the package, all of those classes are inside of it. It's just a way of packaging, as its name suggests, a bunch of classes together. The default as to whether things are visible or not also takes into effect which package you're in. And so here is a summary of all of that, which is a little bit crazy. I'm just going to go through a little bit of this. I need you to get a high level idea of this. This is not something I want you to lose sleep over, but I do need you to understand at least the first bit. So if we are within the same class, meaning I'm writing the class dog and I am a method inside of that class, can I see attributes in there? If the attribute is public, yes, I can see it. If the attribute is protected, yes, I can see it. If the attribute is not specified as public or protected, yes, I can see it. And if it's specified as private, yes, I can see it. So within the same class, no matter what, you will be able to see it. If you are in a subclass of a package, so a child in this case, you'll be able to see the public, the protected, and the defaults, but not the privates. I've already covered that. That makes sense, hopefully. If the parent says it's private, the children cannot see it, but in all other circumstances, the children can see it. And then the last three lines down here refer to other packages and whether or not you're gonna be able to see it within the same package or within a different package. And you can see that the rules are a little bit complex over there. So I'll leave that to you to stare at. Again, I don't want you to lose sleep over the package part right now. I do want you to lose sleep over this bit. This is the most important part of this. I need you to understand that it is in a class versus in a, in a child, which one is going to win. All right, there are language specific rules associated with each modifier, so you might wanna take a look at the book. Private members are not inherited and are not directly accessible from child classes, um, methods and properties. So this last line is just a more specific way of saying what I was saying. If you mark a attribute as private in a parent, you cannot access it in the child. If you mark a method as private in a parent, you cannot call that method in the child. You must have it as protected or as public in order for the child to be able to access it, change it, or call it. All right, so here's a couple of examples again. So we have a class mammal and it has a private body temp, a public get temp method, which just returns it, and a protected change temp, which allows you to change it. This is maybe a common example. So now we're gonna make a dog, which extends mammal. And we're gonna ask, what can you do inside of the um, change temperature? Well, you can call change temperature in your parent because change temperature is protected. And protected means this class and all of its children will be allowed to call it. So it is permissible for me to say super.change temperature and pass it a new temperature and that will work. But if down here I were to say super.body temperature equals seven, I will get an error because body temperature is marked as private. Down here, if I say get temperature, that'll be fine because it's public. Likewise, down here, I can say get temperature and I will have no problems. This is get temperature right there. So I can call change temperature, I can call get temperature, but this will not work because I cannot go up there and actually make a direct change to it. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, couple of last odds and ends about object-oriented inheritance. Um, declaring instance variables as private is the way that you should go. For the most part, you should be making all attributes in a class private and creating getters or setters in order to access it. The availability of the getters and setters as being either public or protected depends on how much you want to lock things down. Why? As I've mentioned before, making things private means that no one else can go in and mess with them, so only your methods can change them and you can make guarantees. 
if we think back to my example when we were talking about the classroom and we were talking about the ability for you know the teacher and all of the different people in the class to be in a two-dimensional array well what happens if i try to access the array at position seven seven zero one two three four five six seven there is no row seven that's going to cause a compile error if i have a method that allows you to get a student from a particular seat I can check for that and I can say if you gave me a number that's greater than the size of the array I'm not going to let you go there if I, if you try to use the forwards and backwards methods to move people up and down the rows well you have to check for the bounds right you can't let them go past zero and you can't let them go past in this case four yes um, because that's as big as the array is so those are conditions that you would want to check for in your getters and setters to stop people from making mistakes and doing crazy things that they shouldn't be allowed to do. So the getters and setters are there to protect the integrity of your variables. That's why the variables should be private and the getters and setters should be how you're actually manipulating. them. If you make a change to the code in a parent, it happens to all of its children. So if I go up to mammal and I change how mammals eat, unless the child has overridden it, all children will get that change. This is a good part of the maintenance. This is the whole reason we're doing this so that the children don't have to go in and modify each of their own ver versions of how to eat. If all mammals eat the same way, you make the change in mammal and everybody automatically gets the change. This one might make you think for a moment, constructors are not inherited. Please note they are called, but they're not inherited. You can't see the inheritance of a constructor. The mammal constructor is not available. There's no method called mammal inside of dog. In order to call it, you have to say super or base in order to specifically call the constructor in your parent. So the constructors are not inherited. And then the last thing is that the class's default empty constructor does nothing, but it is going to be called anyway. To be clear, this is the object called object it has a constructor, it is always called, it just happens to do nothing. So in summary, all inheritance is, is that you as a child class get all the methods and all the attributes that are accessible from your parent. You absorb all of that. You don't get the constructors and you don't get the private members because those are private to the parent. You can only inherit from one class in both C Sharp and Java. You can access your parents' variables methods and constructors using the word super or base if you need to, but you can also just call their methods as long as there's no conflict in the naming. And access modifiers, which is the public, private, or protected, are what specify what is allowed to be inherited and what's not allowed to be inherited. So that is the basics of inheritance. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about polymorphism, which is a specific thing that you use, and I promise to turn the lights on before I record that video. See you soon.